Hey, 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 are you here? Okay, that's a big yup. So let's get started on this episode of the Paul Leslie Hour, and why not, right? Usually, publicists are, you know, behind the scenes. But when you've got an outlook and a life like Gary Springer's had, well, well, you can understand why Paul E. Leslie wanted to interview Gary so much. Like, uh, like his legendary father, the late John Springer, our guest today, Gary Springer, is a film publicist. And you may have read about him on page six, where he told the story about how Marilyn Monroe was his babysitter. <laughs> you just have to stay tuned to hear the rest of that. You're going to love this laid-back interview with Gary Springer, a real, real Hollywood cinema insider. And if you'd like to be an insider with a Paul Leslie Hour, uh-huh, you can. Just go to www.thepaulleslie.com slash support, and you'll know what to do. Fly on the wall? Eavesdropping? Yeah, that's what it's going to feel like, but hey, let's do it. Here's Gary Springer on the Paul Leslie Hour. Have a refreshment. Maybe some popcorn and milk duds. Enjoy! So you are joining us from uh, the great state of New York. Indeed. Um, I live outside of New York City, about 40 miles north of the city, uh, in the woods. And, you know, I I, I grew up in Manhattan, Um, lived there until I was... Well, till I went to boarding school at about 15 and then came back for a few years and then went to L.A. for nine years and then came back here, back east. And eventually I've been up here now 30, 33 years, 32 years up in the woods. But I commuted back and forth mm-hmm. for, you know, another 25 years. But uh, the past few days, you have been enjoying some pool time. I have actually. That's why I was I, I I pushed this back a half an hour because I was playing Cabana Boy and you know putting the chemicals in the pool and, and uh... <laughs> well that's always good. I, I want to properly introduce our guest. Gary Springer is a movie publicist. He has a great story and a great perspective. I've been having a good time listening to other interviews with you and reading different things. He is the son of the late PR legend, John Springer. But Gary Springer is the man at Springer Associates PR. He's also done some acting in such films as Jaws 2, Dog Day Afternoon. He worked on the crew for Taxi Driver, which that's quite quite a thing. A lot of interesting experiences throughout your life. So it's a great opportunity to have you here on the show. Great. Thank you, Paul. I'm glad to be here. So I think most stories are best from the beginning. Could you describe your childhood? What was life like growing up? Oh, I mean, it was it, it was it was great. I mean, I grew up in Manhattan, as I mentioned. My father was a a a, a movie personality, theater, an event publicist, because back then you did everything. Nowadays it's all so specialized, but you know, then you know, when it was just kind of in its infancy in the in the late 50s and, and, and you know, early 60s, you did everything. Um, uh, and my dad represented, he started off, uh, I mean, the long version is when he was 15 years old, he won a national contest. Uh, he was a kid from Rochester, New York, won a national contest that brought him to New York City for the first time ever without supervision because my grandparents said, that's fine, he, he can go. And the very first night um, they, he came in, it was a Paramount contest. They brought him to the Paramount Theater in Times Square and his dates that night were Mary Pickford and Buddy Rogers. Uh, the next day they took him on a tour of New York City and that night brought him to Radio City Music Hall with a girl who was about maybe four years older than he was named Ginger Rogers. Um, the next day they brought him to the theater uh, and the star uh, afterwards, they went out to uh, lunch, and that was Tallulah Bankhead. Mm. And uh, that night, uh, he went out with the woman he wrote the essay about, won him the contest, Sylvia Sidney. 
And every one of those people wound up being clients of my dad's when, you know, in later years. Um, uh, he stayed friendly with every one of them. And so, you know, he's been in it all his life. And I, I've basically been in it all, all my life. I, um, you know, uh, my parents, uh, my parents met, um, my father was living with Bob Sterling. Um, who uh, was dating Ann Jeffries, who was my mother's best friend and was starring in Kiss Me Kate at the time on Broadway. And my mother was in the show. And Sterling was a big RKO star. My father at the time was working for RKO. He was the head of uh, New York publicity for RKO. And um, they were roommates. And of course, you know, Sterling and Ann got together. And then of course, their friends got together. So I basically grew up, you know, with all these people around me. Um, of course, the great story is that my babysitter at one point was Marilyn Monroe. Um, Marilyn actually um, used to do that a, a lot from what I understand. She would, uh, um, like, I'm friends with the Wallachs, Eli Wallach and Ann Jackson's kids, Roberta and Peter and Kathy. And, and of course, Eli was in, couple movies with Marilyn I believe and the um she was always they said that she was always over there you know sending Eli and Ann out and, and watching the kids and that's what she did with my parents a couple of times and um and then of course my first job was when I was in first grade I was um I'd crawl out my seventh floor window go down the fire escape go into the fifth floor take the dog and walk the dog around the block before I went to school and um that was Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. So Paul and Joanne were my first bosses. Hmm. Uh, and, and, and it was great. I mean, uh, you know, my dad has a, a, a photo collection that Getty has now. It's 192,000 movie stills. And I post about two or three times a week on people's birthdays and, and uh, or if they a film opened, I'd post a film and, and, um, it's the John Springer collection on Instagram, if anybody's interested. Um, and yesterday was the anniversary of Richard Burton's death. And Burton was very, very important in our family. My father knew Richard in 1955 and started representing him, um, you know, in, in the 60s, early 60s for Camelot. And then obviously with Elizabeth and, and, and beyond uh, until he died. Um, but yesterday was his birthday and I mean, the, the anniversary of his death. So I posted a picture and a little story about how in 1961, my parents took me to see Camelot and we went to Sardi's afterwards. And the maitre d' at Sardi's said, and who are you here to see? I said, well, I'm here to see the king. And he said, well, who's the king? And I said, Katie Burton's daddy. And uh, so, yeah, so it was a very interesting, interesting way to grow up and, and, I honestly never had any thought of doing this. I, I mean, I went to high school. I went to about four different high schools. Um, two of them, uh, th uh, three of them in, in the first two years. So I actually made the, say, the, the final school for two years. Um, uh, and figured I was gonna go to college. You know, I, I, I mean, I grew up doing this. I would help my father on weekends, work in the office, you know, especially around the New York Film Festival time, which he represented for the first, I don't know, 25 years of its existence. And um, so I, I, I knew it and I, and I did it, but, you know, I was going to go to college for four years. And then, you know, I was at a party with my parents um, in my senior year. We were doing, we bombed in New Haven at school. The Joseph Heller play. And honestly, the only reason I was doing it was because I could get out of curfew because I was in a boarding school and I had no real desire to be an actor. Um, but I was talking to this guy at this New Year's Eve party that my parents took me to. And a couple of weeks later, my father called me up and said, you know, Yvonne Posser uh, would love to talk to you. Um, he, he, do you remember him? I said, yeah, I met him at, uh, you know, New Year's. And uh, I, I said, what does he want? And my dad goes, oh, I don't know. And so Yvonne called me at school. I gave him the number at the doormaster's house and, you know, said, you know, you have a very interesting quality. I'm doing a movie. I think you'd be perfect for it. I said, but I'm not an actor. He said, well, you told me you were acting. I said, yeah, but that's just so I can get out of curfew. Um, but uh, he said, no, no, 
you'll be great in this. You'll be you'll you'll be fine. It's a movie that I'm doing. It's with Carol O'Connor um, and Ernest Borgnine. And I said, oh, then I said, I can't, you know, I'm in school. He said, well, you know, O'Connor's shooting all in the family. So we're shooting it in the summer. I said, okay. So then my teacher who was doing, we bombed in New Haven, heard about that I was, you know, I told him I was doing this. And he said, well, you know, I've been talking with Joseph Heller because this was 1972. We bombed in New Haven was always done in army uniforms and very straight. And um, uh, we did it all black, surrealistic very strange and so he and heller decided to do it uh in in new york so uh, the teacher asked me if i wanted to be in it he said well you're acting in a movie in new york you want to be in the play and play the same role you played in uh, up at school so i said sure so uh for the i was 17 years old uh we were doing it at the uh circle in the square downtown for the first four performances i was totally nude the entire time on stage um painted in a pale blue body makeup blood spattered all over me because i was one of the idiots one of the soldiers who gave in to the authority because like catch 22 hate new haven was an anti-authority play and um and then i did this movie uh right after, oh and the play opened and closed in the same night got terrible terrible reviews and they mm. decided to close it uh so my baptism of fire in the new york theater um, but then following that, I, I did the movie with O'Connor and Borgnine, and I played a punk kid, and they were auxiliary cops trying to clean up their neighborhood, and, and they see me smoking pot against the wall, and every time they come up and harass me or try to bring me into the precinct or something, all I do is I look at them and I go, fuck you. And that was my building. I was billed as the fuck you kid. What he saw in me, I don't know, but <laughs> anyway, it was a great... All of a sudden, I did a off-Broadway play and 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 a movie the year after I graduated from high school, and then in January I went to college, and got there, and they said, "Oh, it's the New York fucking actor," and that turned me off, and I quit college and <laughs> moved back to New York, which was actually the best thing because I was in New York for the cast and crew screening of Law and Disorder. And the casting director said, "You know, you were very good in this. We're doing another movie, and you should come and try out for it." I said, well, I'm not really an actor. And, you know, I don't have an agent or anything. He said, that's fine. You'll come. And it was, and I dog day afternoon. And mm. I played Al Pacino's partner. I chickened out of the bank robbery. And I got an agent. And they got me a movie right away and sent me to Hollywood. Before that, though, I decided I really liked the idea of being a New York crew guy from working on Law and Disorder and, and then Dog Day. And much of this crew was the same. And I just loved the way the camaraderie between those guys. And it was like, you know, it was one big family and they went from project to project, which is why I, I, I was a PA on Taxi Driver. I called up um, Marty and my father had worked together for a while and I knew Marty and, and said, look, you know, and he said, but I, I, Sydney said how good you were in this movie. And I said, you know what? I don't really, I really want to do become a crew guy. And um, so that's why I did Taxi Driver. And then uh, that was the uh, summer of 74, 75, something like that. And we finished in August and September was the New York Film Festival. And my dad was representing it again. And I was there and on opening night, one of the top agents at ICM said, you know, I just saw a sneak of dog day. You were very good. Who's your agent? I said, oh, I don't have an agent. I'm going to go through the DGA program. And they said, well, you know, we can still send you out. So I said, all right. So they sent me out, got me a job um, within two weeks and called Bernice Bob's Her Hair. And it was with Shelley Duvall and Bud Court and Dennis Christopher and Veronica Cartwright. And we shot it in Savannah, Georgia. And Shelley and I became great friends and they were back over, over New Year's, she and her boyfriend and said, you know, when do you have to go back to school? Because I was taking courses at Hunter, not anything real. And um, I said, well, not till February. He said, well, come out to California. And I said, well, my agents want me to go out. So I moved out to LA and wound up living with them for 11 months and, and, then, uh, and then stayed for another eight or nine years and did things like Happy Days and Jaws 2 and Small Circle of Friends and Hometown USA, which I actually starred in. And um, 
another one that closed. Actually, that, 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 that didn't really even open. It opened at the second bill on Hollywood Boulevard. But um, one of the great stories there is that Elizabeth Taylor by now is married to John Warner and is living in Washington and sent my father a picture because my father's one of his best friends in the world was Henry Fonda. And um, Elizabeth sent my father a picture of Gary, uh, the local drive-in, Gary Springer in Hometown USA, Jay Fonda in the China Syndrome. And, um, uh, but you know, I never really wanted to be an actor. And it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful life. It's, a, it's, it's great fun. It's, it's, you know, you get to play. I was very good at playing myself. I didn't have great range, but I played myself very well. Um, I met my, uh, my future wife when I was in Martha's Vineyard. She was a waitress in Martha's Vineyard when we were shooting Jaws 2. And we kind of had a long distance relationship. And then she wound up coming out to California and um, we decided to get married and came back east to get married. And while we were back east, my father said, you know, Kara uh, White, who was his work for him, just left to become the head of TriStar Publicity. He said, you'd be great if you wanted to uh, come back. I don't know who to get, but I know you and Nancy are very happy out there. And she started kicking me under the table and crying. And I said, Dad, you know, I like being an actor. I've had a great time doing it. I've had great experiences. But I really, because I had been working in his office in LA for the last two years, because Nancy was a teacher. Um, and she taught deaf children at the John Tracy Clinic. So she'd get up at six in the morning. And if I didn't have an audition, I'd get up at noon. And um, it just wasn't working with this relationship. So I asked my dad if I can come and work in the office out there. Uh, and actually one of my first clients when I started working for him in California was the sale of Pickfair, which of course was Mary Pickford's house and Douglas Fairbanks, but became Mary Pickford and Buddy Rogers. And it turns out, you know, I'm working my first big PR job is the same one that um, my father did in 1932 when he met, you know, Mary and, and, and Buddy. So everything comes full circle. Hmm. Um, but we moved back in the early 80s. And I, you know, I acted for a little bit longer. I did some jobs. I went out. I did a fairy tale for Shelley. Um, you know, she had that fairy tale theater. I remember those. It was great. Yeah, great. wonderful. And, and um Came back to New York and pretty much I've been doing the, the PR movies, Broadway shows. I've done 22 Broadway shows. Um, and I've been representing movies and some personalities, not like the old days, not like with my dad. My dad represented, you know, Marilyn, Richard Elizabeth, Warren Beatty, Julie Christie, Eve Montand, Joan Crawford, Betty Davis, Myrna Loy, Henry Fonda, Jimmy Stewart. You know, I mean, he had stars and personalities and and um i didn't really do that it was a whole different you know it was a whole different era and was actually starting to get where it was much more organized like theater people just did theater you know movie people just did movie and then there was people who just did personalities um i was still lucky that i you know learned from my dad and i've worked with him so i still had a range where i was doing all those different things but um and I've been doing it since. Uh, um, I had an office, actually, my office um, uh, for about, oh, I don't know, 20, 25 years was um, in the old Paramount building at 1501 Broadway on Times Square, which is where the Paramount Theater was, which also goes back to that very first night that my dad was there because he won the Paramount contest. And that's where they brought him to meet Buddy and Mary Pickford. So it all comes full circle. Yeah. Well, so speaking of, of full circle, was there any lessons in terms of, of publicity that you learned from your dad that you apply to this day? Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, it's one reason I did it. I'm going to come back and work with the best. But, you know, I mean, first of all, honesty. Um, uh, I, there's a lot of publicists I know who aren't always honest. And my father said, I never lied to the press. I didn't always tell them all the all the facts are the truth, but I never lied to the press because then that way they're never going to trust you or your clients. Um, and my father was a gentleman. He was, you know, when he died, I think Variety said he was the last gentleman in a business with very few gentlemen. Mm. Um, and I learned that. And that's, you know, my clients become my friends, more or less, even if it's just for that project. 
It isn't like it's not, you know, it's not a one shot deal. Oh, I got to work with this one. I got to work with that one. For that, for that time, for that time period, they become my best friends because that's, that's the way I learned it. Has there been a film that you worked on that just you, you are still to this day, you're absolutely mesmerized by this movie? As an actor or as a publicist? As a publicist. One that just it blew you away. You were, and it was so great to work on it. I mean, there have been so many. I mean, I've done, uh, I remember Tess of the Durbervilles back, you know, which I, I just loved. I just remembered it. What a, what a great movie that was. Um, I'd say in recent years, two movies that I just, knocked me out. One was a movie called Jodorowsky's Dune, which was um, Alejandro Jodorowsky um, was going to make Dune after uh, after he made some of his wild, wild, you know, bizarre movies. And he couldn't get the money. I mean, he had he had the entire book. He had like 3000 um, drawings uh, that they put together. Um, and he had uh, Geiger. Um, Geiger, who was the guy who did the uh, design, the aliens for Alien, among other things. And they put this together. It was such a great movie. And I still think it was better than any of the Dunes that, that we've seen since. And the, the other one that really knocked me out, I just, I could watch it over and over again, was um, Only Lovers Left Alive, the Jim Jarmusch movie with Tilda Swinton and um, Tom and anyway, yeah, yeah. I mean, I just, I, that, I, that blew me away. It was so terrific. But one of the most fun I ever had working on a movie was when I was still in college and my father was representing um, Cinema 5, which was the big movie chain in New York City. It was, it was the Walter Reed theaters and the Cinema 5 theaters. And they were also distributing. And my dad was representing them. And he came up with um, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Uh, he was representing that movie in the US. And Don Rugoff, who was the, the head of Cinema 5, came up with the idea of having people wearing the costumes that the actors wore in the movie, wandering around the streets of New York. So I got one of my college buddies, my, you know, my, my best buddy. And, you know, we had beards, not as full as yours, but, you know, we had to glue them on every day. And um, he wore Graham Chapman's uh, costume, which of course was King Arthur. And I wore Michael Palin's, which was Sir Galahad. And we had this street theater kid who we dressed in rags and carried the banner and he carried the flyers and the coconuts. And we, and we wound up wandering the streets of New York for about two weeks, going into in chain mail, which was wool and, you know, very hot, but going into every bar called the Round Table or Edward's, you know, pub or whatever, and jousting, and then they buy us drinks. And then we did that in Washington and Boston and Philadelphia, cities that you could move. So that was, I probably saw, and I also had to write a paper for college. So I figured, oh, well, hell, I've got this right in front of me. So I saw probably Monty Python on the Holy Grail about 45 times. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the opening night party, they also decided to do it in the most bizarre place they can. And they did it in a giant massage parlor, massage parlor on 42nd and Lexington in what's now the Great Hyatt Hotel next to Grand Central. But the entire second floor was this den of iniquity. And they kept all the girls who were working there and it was a party. We had all the Pythons were there and um, uh, uh, Robert Plant and Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin took our swords and they were jousting in the halls and, and Andy Warhol was in the hot tub with Rex Reed. And, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was one of the great film experiences of my life. If somebody out there is interested in maybe starting their own public relations firm, or getting hired to work for a, a, you know, maybe they want to work for Rogers and Cowan or one of the PMK. 
What kind of advice Actually, would you Rogers give? Rogers and Cowan is now PMK. That's right. They, yeah, they I forgot that. So it's Rogers and Cowan, PMK, BNC. One giant name and, and yeah. firm. What advice would you give? First of all, you have to be a good writer because, I mean, you really have to. I, basically, what I do is I'm a salesman. Uh, you know, uh, I sell a product whether it be a personality or whether it be a movie or whether it be a play, I'm still selling a product to people like you. I send out, I, I send out a release and I say, Paul, you know, I've got this blah, 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 blah. Is opening is opening soon. We just did interviews for a movie called jazz fest, which I was representing. And um, you did uh, uh, Frank Marshall, uh, the director, Frank, of course, who produced things like, you know, all the Jurassic parks and, the Indiana Joneses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and directed this movie. And, but basically I'm a salesman. Mm -hmm. I'm selling my product to the, to the media. And again, when all the others, but you have to write because you have to be able to have that gift of dab to pitch over the phone. Although you don't pitch over the phone like you used to because right. nobody wants to pick up the phone. So it's really all done by email. And nowadays, nobody responds to their emails. Mm. <laughs> That's very frustrating in the long run. But, you know, when you see a, you know, a, a, a review in a newspaper or a photo in a magazine of an upcoming movie, that's not there just because it just showed up. It's somebody like me had to contact the, you know, the media, the journalists. So the first thing is, if they want to do it, is to, to really write well, to be able to, to be able to come up with a good pitch to be able to come up with a good storyline. You know, you've already got a movie behind you or a Broadway show or a book. You know, they're all pretty much similar in, in what you have to do. You're still selling a product mm. and you have to sell it. And then, you know, I mean, and then it is, it is tough because, you know, I mean, you, you could start off Start off doing, you know, if you if you know you were in high school. I mean, one of the things when I was in high school, um, when I wasn't doing plays to get out of out of um, curfew, I would do the publicity for the plays because I I I knew it from my dad, and um, uh, I would write the programs, which you know, the the Broadway publicist still has to put the program together. Playbill doesn't do that. The Broadway publicist puts it all together and submits it to Playbill. So I was doing that and I was, you know, sending out stuff to the local newspapers about our school play. And um, so, you know, and it's practice and it's, it's how I, it's, it's kind of how I, I, I felt comfortable doing it. And when I started working with my dad, I had already knew the whole idea behind it, but um, honestly, I'm bad because I, I did work for my dad. So I never really had to go out and and find a job and then when he retired and finally died i just took it over but um but i think that's the most it's having a gift of gab having a wit and being a good salesman now when i do these lightning round questions they're just kind of like quick question quick answers and i don't know what it is but for some reason i get the most responses from listeners about these so doesn't have to be your definitive answer, but your favorite movie of all time. I think The Godfather. The Godfather. What about it? I loved epics. I always loved epics. Um, uh, Bridge Over the River Kwai, Lawrence of Arabia, Gone with the Wind. I just love these big grand epics. And The Godfather whole saga was one of the great grand epics of all time. Absolutely. What about a person that you have been around as a result of your publicity work or from your acting experiences that you genuinely were in awe of? Well, I mean, as I said, I, I you know, I grew up with a lot of different people. Um, I, I think the one person that I met who I just out of everybody else was Groucho Marx. Wow. That, yes. Yeah. Say no more. <laughs> what about a place that you you have been to? Something I thought was very interesting about you is all these different places. Like not a lot of people get to do a uh, 
something related to film publicity and go to the Red Sea. Uh, <laughs> what what places have you been to that just a few that have really been very interesting for you to visit? Well, I mean, uh, I was a juror at the uh, Dhaka Film Festival in Bangladesh. Uh, not a lot of people get to Bangladesh. Right. Um, uh, I was a, a, a panelist at a, at, a, at a convention in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Um, I was a juror in, at the Trumpso Film Festival. Trumpso is in Norway. It's 400 miles north of the Arctic Circle in January. So it's cold and dark. Um, but, the, you know, I mean, and that's one of the things that I, I, I do love. And Egypt, I've been going to the, to the uh, El Guna Film Festival for the last five years, which is on the Red Sea. And Cairo, um, uh, El Guna is in October, then back to, back to uh, Cairo. And um, fascinating. Hmm. What about a place that you would like to visit that you haven't been to? I've never really done Argentina or Chile. And I've always, I actually represented the Chilean film last year for the Academy Award for the best foreign film uh, section. And I've always wanted to go down there um, and, and, and explore that area. The greatest living American director. Probably I would say Marty Scorsese. Um, he just has such a range and, 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 and so prolific and not just in film and all of the, you know, in, in the reconstruction and, and, uh, of films and, and uh, yeah, I'd probably say Marty. How would you describe Martin Scorsese? A dynamo, a <laughs> nuclear power plant. <laughs> <laughs> he's short, he's Italian, and he's got that energy. So how did you come to uh, work on the Jazz Fest in New Orleans story documentary? Um, well, as I said, I'm, I'm an independent. I don't work for... Rogers and Cowan PMK BNC Corporation, because I took over from my dad. And my dad, you know, had his own office. Um, and Sony Pictures Classics has been very good to me. Um, and they, they, they give me a number of movies. They work with about five or six different PR companies. Um, because obviously the big Sonys, the Universals, the big Warner Brothers, they have their own in-house PR offices and things. But a lot of like, you know, the, the Focuses and the Magnolias and the Sony Pictures Classics, they do their own, uh, uh, you know, they, 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 they hire out to the agencies. And Sony has been very good to me. And, and um, I actually did two movies this fall for the, this spring. At the same time, I did Jazz Fest uh, and I did The Phantom of the Open, which Jazz Fest was a documentary, a music documentary. Um, and the Phantom of the Open was a, a, a feature film starring Mark Rylance and Sally Hawkins and um, was about golf and life. So very different movies. But uh, again, it's, you know, you can really do most anything uh, because it's just a salesman. You mm. know, I'm selling a product and I like everything about every movie I've worked on. Even if the, even if there's, you know, if it's difficult, there's always aspects of stage shows or movies, whether it be, whether it be certain scenes or the actors, even if it's not the greatest thing in the world, you always find something that buoys you and, and energizes you to be able to go in and, 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 and sell it. What do you hope people say about you when you're not in the room? I'm a good guy. That's what I hope. And um, because I am a good guy. And that, again, that's something I learned from my father, who also, one of his other things that, that I learned, my father never gossiped, you know, because, and when people asked him to write a book, and he always said, no, 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 I have I was raised by the Jesuits, and I have the seal of confession. Besides, if I wrote a book, what would your clients think? So we always kept it 
close. What is the best thing about being Gary Springer? I've always had freedom. I've always, I've always done things that I want to do. I've never, I've never felt constricted by anything. Um, I have two wonderful kids or actually one, my son died uh, last April. He was a, um, uh, I got sick in 1999, um, uh, became a quad amputee, but went on to become a gold medal winner. Here's the hmm. Olympic gold medal in the, in the Beijing Olympics and won the bronze in London and wheelchair rugby, which is also known by the film version, murder ball, uh, which I represented um, uh, at Sundance and all the way to the Academy Awards. And um, he unfortunately, from when he got sick, it just, his body was never perfect and he wound up dying. But I have a, a, a daughter and two grandchildren and a beautiful woman I live with and, um, and work that I like doing. I, I mean, I like working on movies. I like pushing these things because they're, every one of them is different. Um, I remember one time I was in Cannes and I was talking to Ed Pressman, who was quite a you know, big producer. We were um, at the Hotel du Cap, which has this long, long walkway with these beautiful poplar trees going all the way down to the, to the Mediterranean. And the two of us, it was the end of Cannes. It was a busy time. And we're like, oh, God, I can't wait to get home. Oh, this is such a pain in the ass. Oh, this is awful. And then you look around and he says, yeah, but we could be working in a bank. We could be working in a cubicle. And so that's what that's one of the great things is freedom. You know, I've always been able to, you know, I work from home way before COVID. I closed my office in 2015 in Times Square because I realized that People weren't coming to the office, you know. I don't do theater anymore because of that. Because to do Broadway shows, you really got to be there, you know, because you're always running backstage or you're running to the box office. But um, uh, I still do the events and the and the movies and you know and work freedom. I love that, I, I, and I love the way you put it. Uh, uh, so often, it's all about perspective. Well, I always like to give the guest the stage or the microphone or however you want to put it. Uh, it's been really great to, to, to talk to you. And I hope to run into you at a, a film festival or a movie sometime, a movie theater sometime. But what You're would you in Charleston, right? I am, yes. I would get down there. My niece lives down there. So, you know, and uh, uh, another one of my friends works for the Savannah College of Art and Design. So I get down to that neighborhood every once in a while. So I wouldn't be surprised if we run into each other someplace. I hope so. I hope so. But anything you'd like to leave our, our listeners and viewers with? You know, I mean, you just said, what is life like for Gary? It's a great life. I loved, I mean, I love being an actor. Um, I never wanted to be an actor, but when I, for the 10 years that I was doing that, it, it, what a great experience. I love growing up um, uh, in show business, um, you know, with my with my parents going to the theater, going to movies, going, um, you know, uh, with the theater people and show business people are fun. They're interesting. They're quirky. They're 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 fun. And I've enjoyed my entire life as a publicist. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different professions, and you know. When you live in LA, you really only know showbiz people because it's such a city. But you know, being in New York, you've got neighbors who do everything. They're investors. They're you know, they're post office people. There's you know, I mean everything, and people are good. Showbiz people are a lot of fun. It's a great it's a great life. And if anybody's thinking of going into it, um, I would certainly recommend it. Well, Gary Springer, what a pleasure to talk to you on this on this Saturday morning and I, I wish you a wonderful week ahead and until we meet again well I appreciate it Paul and and uh, uh, I'm sure we will because uh, you know I'll have more projects and you know you know I'll be coming to you and saying hey do you want to talk to so-and-so hey I got this movie opening up you want to talk to so-and-so and, -so? and uh, that's that's the way it happens 
Right. The show must go on. Exactly. You know, the Paul Leslie Hour is made possible by people like you, listeners, viewers. Please go to thepaulleslie.com slash support, and you'll know what to do when you're there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who contributes. Performance of The Entertainer intro song by John Primerano. And, of course, this is your announcer speaking. See you next time on the Paul Leslie Hour.